Bill, by the way, you're going to get special introductory music on your own this morning. I'm breaking I'm, I'm looking free forward of tone to it. I'm looking forward to so, it. Just so you know here. All right, we begin with today, Mr. Alonzo Perry. Welcome back, Alonzo. How'd the debate thing go last week? Uh, the debates were outstanding. How'd you I guys finish? Fun. Uh, I mean, I got second in parliamentary, uh, second in Lincoln Douglas, and I got like the year award for a single dramatic interpretation. Oh, that's Patrick awesome. Henry speech. Well, good. What is uh, Well, this is not interview time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's intro time. Well, he, he threw out these terms. I don't know what the meaning would be. <laughs> Speaking of Lincoln, this is the yeah. birth date of his son, Edward Baker Lincoln, 1846. All right, let us all salute our first panelist, Alonzo Perry. Even if the admiral said some of his takes are a little scary, Alonzo has been with us a while. My, well, my, well, my kind has been away. And since the session ends soon, this may be Alonzo's last regular day. But he ain't done yet. No, not by a mile. So if we're sending Mr. Perry out today, let's do it in style. I like that. I like that a lot. <laughs> Next up would be Mr. Anders. Let's all pause for a moment of silence while Chris comes back from the bathroom. <laughs> 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 Moving along. <laughs> Our next panelist is busy practicing the law, which means he flaps his gums and he flaps his jaw. But there's a lot about this guy that to me is still a mystery. But some of his stuff I can figure just based on his history. Like I know he's on this show each week expressing his views. And I also know for sure Larry Schultz doesn't spend his evening watching Fox News. <laughs> <laughs> you are correct, sir. Though we probably ought to uh, spend a little time and, you know, record a little bit because it may not be here that much. <laughs> <laughs> that twinge of hope in your voice I heard there. I think. Uh, earlier this week, we had on the Berkeley County prosecuting attorney named Katie. Now, that's an impressive person and truly one tough prosecuting lady. However, there's one thing that bothered me the last time she came, and that's when people mispronounced her Italian last name. So here's a tip for all of you who call her Dele Delegati instead of Delegetti. <laughs> Next time you say it, just remember to rhyme it with Joe, Joey Torch Ferretti. <laughs> Pronunciation you got a lot of mileage on that one, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's always the Italian angle. I like it. It, always, it's, it is always the Italian angle here. Okay, now it's time for the Admiral. All right, Bill, here comes yours, baby. All right. Beware the Ides of March just five days from now. That's when they took down the emperor. Took him down in how? <laughs> Despite what some think, our next panelist was not there to warn the Caesar. Because if he was, you can bet old Julius would have been a believer. Like Huey Lewis, maybe he could do it and go back in time to battle with the Roman Senate and help me with this rhyme. Maybe fighting that Senate wouldn't have worked. After all, Bill's not a wrestler. And if Stubblefield went back in time, it wouldn't be a DeLorean. It'd be in a Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea how you were going to do that, Rob. <laughs> well done. I didn't either until 9 o'clock last night. It's <clears throat> impressive. It's impressive. Over a couple beers. <laughs> <laughs> or something more robust than a beer. Uh, now, Bill, before we go to Joe with issue number one, if you would like to ask Alonzo your question. Yeah. Now we'll... you, you mentioned a couple of the categories of debate. Would you explain what they are? Oh, so yeah. Lincoln Douglas is a policy debate where there's two uh, individuals, an affirmative constructive, a negative constructive, and they battle over a policy that's set year long. So I guess the resolution this year was if we should increase restrictions on uh, campaign spending, right? And we get to argue, you know, like a mechanism and um, our solution for it, you know. Now, did you know which side you were going to be on before the debate started? Well, it, what's great about it is you get to do both sides. You do so, both sides. Okay. Yeah, so the negative is only responsible for deconstructing the affirmative's plan, and the affirmative has to create a plan. It's the closest thing you get to, like, testifying in front of Congress or something. Sure. Okay. Uh, parliamentary debate is a team event. It's, you know, you have uh, the prime minister and your member of government versus the leader of opposition and... Uh, Opposite or member of opposition and what you do is you basically have like four different topics there's different styles of it and you guys will go kind of competitively in that aspect and then another thing that I did was single dramatic interpretation which is where you take like a film or something and you convert it into like a single you know uh, person interpretation of that event so I took uh, it was Patrick Henry's uh, give me liberty or give me death speech that was in this movie and I went and recreated it and I think you know it was really good so, so you had a chance to prepare 
order for each one of these. It was not spontaneous. Well, the parliamentary debate is spontaneous. You know, they'll just put out a resolution like, you know, something like, oh, the, you know, U.S. should sunset payments to Ukraine and then you have like 20 minutes to develop a case and then the government will come bring the fo bring the case forward define the terms and um, you know it's it's a really fun event I think that debate is probably the most formidable thing that I've done in co college whatsoever you know because it's it's uh, you get to think on your toes you get to do a lot of research um, you know you become a, a real subject matter expert on whatever you know uh, you have to kind of debate on or whatever. And there's multiple uh, different types of events. There's like 13 in total. I couldn't go through yeah. all of them. How Bill. Does, how does Bill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this has to end at some yeah, point. Well, well, one quick, how there is it, no one quick. What do you mean yeah. one quick? One quick was five minutes ago. How, how does this compare to going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Larry Schultz? Uh, you know, I, <laughs> I wish I had way more time to deconstruct some of Larry's arguments, I'll be honest with you. But. I'm finished, Rob. Now, now I'm sorry because I ruined your punchline. I'm sorry. All right. Uh, and uh, Larry, you need to plug something. Yes. Um, as many of you know, I'm involved with a group called Community Alternatives to Violence. Yes. There is right now in the United Way of the Eastern Panhandle a thing called the Unity Campaign. We need you to, if you would be so kind, go on the um, uh, United Way website, pick out the Unity campaign. You have a chance to select from, uh, I don't know, 40 or 50 different charities. Pick our charity, put it in there, donate some money. At the end, it will all go to CAV and there will be a match. So you can grow the size of your donation just by doing this one thing. The problem is it only runs until March 15th. So we're getting short on time. Got to act quickly. Thank you very much. All right, for issue number one, we go to Joseph Joey Torts Ferretti. Mr. Ferretti, you're on the clock. Well, and let me just say I appreciate Larry's work with that organization. I, I, I've supported it in the past, hope to do so again. And I know, it's a Larry, it's a worthwhile cause, and certainly your, uh, your sweat equity in that uh, – organization uh, should be respected highly because it uh, does good work. And, Thank and you I very much. You guys continue. Uh, Rob, I guess it's time to do a little bit of review now. Now that our eyes have glazed over for the past month talking about tax policy in the state of West Virginia, well, we have a tax law now, and it's been passed, and we know pretty much what the parameters are with regard to tax cuts. We're going to get 21 and a quarter percent personal income tax cuts. We're going to get uh, our car tax money rebated to us as a tax credit. And small businesses are going to get a 50% tax credit on money they pay for equipment, machinery, and inventory. So the question this morning is, are we comfortable with $700 million in revenues now being sent back to the citizens of West Virginia in light of the significant needs that we have in the state, much like uh, was discussed in the first segment of this show regarding DHHR and the foster care system, we know the state has serious financial needs. Did the legislature strike the right balance with the level of cutting and, uh, and tax relief for the citizens? And are we confident that even with these tax cuts, the state will be in a financial position to handle the other needs we have, which we know are uh, teachers and PEIA and correctional officers, infrastructure, uh, economic development funds that we spend like uh, like water uh, when we have uh, uh, businesses looking to locate in the state of West Virginia. Did the legislature strike the right balance here going forward? That's my question. Admiral, let's go to you first. Uh, yeah, I think they did, Joe. Uh, each one of us come at this differently. Uh, but the, the Republicans had campaigned, not this time, but for the last several elections, of cutting taxes. Uh, they had made a commitment they had to cut taxes. Uh, personally, uh, I think we should have spent less time cutting taxes and more time uh, addressing our infrastructure needs. And every time we've had one of these discussions on Friday or during the week, we see a different suite of infrastructure needs that need to be addressed. And all we're doing, I think, is Band-Aid approach. And we're going to 
we will continue doing Band-Aid approach, uh, but I, I don't think they had any real choice. They had already marched down uh, this this plank from the ship, and they were they they were committed to it, and so they were going to have to do a tax cut. Uh, I think under those parameters, uh, they did a uh, a good job. Alonzo, well, I I. Mm. I think that the the tax cut is definitely a, a net positive for West Virginians. I think that, you know, uh, they told us they were going to give us a tax cut. And if I can remember correctly, people thought I had a little bit too much faith in the government that they were going to be able to actually pass a tax cut for us. So um, looking at the, the amount, the size, the scope, I think this was a net positive. I, I truly believe that, um, you know, uh, we walked away the winners from this. And while there are concerns about infrastructure and child care and some of the other aspects, let's also talk about how, you know, they have prioritized economic development. And I believe that, you know, that's going to bring more income for the state through these latter years because of the investments that they're taking now. So I do believe that this was a great win for the West Virginia GOP, and I'm glad to see this tax cut come into fruition. Uh, uh, West Virginia GOP. Uh, not the legislators in total. Well, I, I think that I mean, what do you? What, what's the distinction you set here? But probably not. Probably not. There should be. There should be. We should be looking at this from the legislators acting uh, in as a body, as opposed to just a, uh, a a part of it. But yeah, your your point's well taken. It is a GOP driven body just now. But I think it's a victory nonetheless. And in, in your defense, uh, in regards to doubters, two weeks ago, it didn't look like there'd be any type of an agreement yeah, on a tax right. cut. They were as far as ways they could be. Larry Schultz. Yes. In addition to, uh, as we spoke about earlier, a third of CPS positions being unfilled today, we have about a third of correction officers positions in this state that are not filled. You can't have a credible criminal justice system if the prison system is broken and and as i understand it today there are national guardsmen serving in our penitentiaries as uh corrections officers that that's a level of crisis that many states tax cut or no tax cut never see and i do not hear on either of those fronts the kind of <clears throat> the kind of insistence that we must fix this that I would like to hear. Um, of course, the tax cut means it is less likely. Everyone knows, as, uh, as the delegate who was on with us in the first uh, half hour said, there's lots of jobs that are going wanting today. But they are not jobs where the government has put somebody in prison or the government has taken a child away from his parents and the government is laying back and not doing its job. So I don't care about the size of the tax cut as long as you address these other issues. We just had a three month long legislative session and other than uh, D Delegate uh, Burkhammer's bill, which is an important thing to do, we're not seeing any address to it at all. Well, the governor did um, give a cost of living or locality pay bump to CPS workers in the Eastern Panhandle. Yes. And I'm not sure that extended to all state employees or just CPS workers. It would be interesting to know if that's having any effect. Yeah. It seems like a lot mm -hmm. of money. Uh, I think one of the numbers I read was 20%, but it all depends on 20% of what. Oh, yeah. uh, if you're already only making half what the guy who makes subs at Sheets makes, then <laughs> maybe 20% ain't that much. But uh, so there's two parts to this, Larry. One is the salary, which I think the governor's addressed. The other one is the appropriated dollars to hire new caseworkers, and I'm not yes. seeing any evidence of a of appropriated dollars for new or for an influx of new caseworkers. Well, and the other part that we haven't mentioned is this is also part of a national problem in the United States right now. I heard this during one of our financial reports on CNBC that we run in the morning. There are currently two job openings for every one unemployed person in America. So if you look at the odds of filling jobs right now, if you're not qualified through your degree or whatever for work in Child Protective Services, or the starting salary, even with that 20% bump, isn't good enough, 
then what are the odds of your job getting filled versus another one that pays a lot more and has an awful lot less stress than what a CPS worker goes through? I mean, I always think with CPS workers, I don't pretend to fully understand what they do, but I'm always brought back to this notion uh, that you see on ESPN, you had one job. And can you imagine what it's like going to bed, having elected not to take children out of a home, worried that maybe you made a mistake? That is a difficult job. And that's not something that you can do uh, like you would work in retail. Uh, That's something where the lives, the literal lives of children are at stake in your decisions. So it is an important job and a really difficult one. But there's other ways you can address this, and that's can hire folks not as a full-fledged caseworker, but someone to support the caseworker that would do a lot of the paperwork. So take some of the uh, some of the administrative burden off of them. That would that would have the same result. You'd still have a caseworker being able to address a specific problem, and if, that's dealing with the child. If you could find the people to fill those jobs. You could come near finding those as administrative support than you can as a fully qualified caseworker. You look around the country right now, Bill, and what's what are the most difficult jobs to fill? Support jobs, mm-hmm. right? And those are the most difficult jobs to fill right now. Joe, it comes back to you. Well, I, first of all, uh, I agree with Alonzo. Uh, it was a, uh, a feat for the legislature to get the tax cuts through, golf clap to them. Uh, but The concern I have on the back end is we still don't have a bill that is viable right now to increase correctional officer pay. And Larry's right. Not only do we have National Guardsmen in our prisons, we have DNR employees watching over our prisoners. These are game wardens who are being repurposed to work in the correctional system. It is an emergency. There's a federal lawsuit pending over prison conditions in the state of West Virginia. Uh, Something needs to be done there. I'm hoping that this legislature can get through in these last few days the much-needed legislation. They they seem to have handled PEIA, and that's going to be, you know, uh, money out of people's pocket to make that work, but that's another debate for another day. And they seem to have addressed a little bit with regard to teachers. It sounds like that the uh, teacher's aid bill is going to go through eventually, but it's on a last-minute uh, uh, schedule right now. Uh, some of the more wanting needs <laughs> in this state uh, are, are really here up against the deadline as far as the legislature dealing with them. So, uh, again, uh, the tax breaks are great. Everybody's going to benefit from them who uh, pays an income tax. But certainly the other needs of the state – Uh, remain to be addressed it's going to cost a lot of money and i hope we can walk and chew gum at the same time here because it's it's much needed in this state can you have a state that identifies itself with low taxes and even before the tax cut west virginia was a low tax state okay but can you have a state that identifies itself with low taxes and also have well-paid state employees can you do both absolutely i mean look at florida you know, Florida is one of those states that, uh, you know, has attracted a large volume of people, have passed historic tax cuts and, you know, has uh, uh, historically low taxes. But the volume of people in the state cause it to be able to fund a lot of its, you know, services and uh, no, create yeah, high paid. Don't compare employees. West Virginia to Florida yeah. because well, you, you can give me I'd another say. state that's similar to West Virginia in profile, geography, age health give you know tax status that's the comparison one because you you should never compare west virginia to florida we don't have ocean around three sides of us i mean we all have or disney world golf yeah and disney world and 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 whether that uh, you know 300 days out of the year is paradise alonzo we may be able to do it but i don't think we have been doing it and so you have to look at our track record and uh, our our employees have not been keeping up with their their salary needs. Our state employees. I mean, for you know, just the general different jurisdictions. I mean, you know, you take twenty nine thousand dollars to you know a year to McDowell County, and that's a, a fair living. But you know, you take that to the Eastern Panhandle, and it's not. And so, locality pay has been the thing that you know we have all in unison championed as you know a 
a, a, a grand change for but, state employees here. But, but we have functional we, we issues. We were told this past week by one of the delegates it's not going to happen. It's and, not going to happen this year. And when, you know, the southern parts of the state and, and some of the areas that are <laughs> afraid of locality pay, you know, are are fighting against it, you know, there's going to have to be a compromise. There's going to have to be, you know, some, some soul searching that's done in the legislature to say, hey, you guys get this, we get this, you know, because it, it – it is causing functional problems that are, you know, uh, to a boiling point. I, I will fully agree with you on that. But uh, it, there's almost no uh, solution, but rather trade-offs that have to be made in order to uh, make sure that we can do things like fund our prisons, to make sure that we can do. And, and that's another thing, because, you know, I think that the child care issue is completely different than the actual prison guard issue. One uh, has to do with, you know, the demonization of police, the fact that no one wants to go in any type of correctional, you know, position because it's a side of authority and law and order. And uh, the child issue, you know, has to do with more with root causes of, of parent or family, you know, destruction. So, you know, until we're dealing with the opioid crisis and some of these things that are contributing to these two different crises, and we can't hold them in the same light. Um, there, there is a lot of work that needs to be done, and I don't think that that's why there's this one size fits all or or you know grand uh, money scheme that's going to you know pay our way out of this. And I don't think that the tax situation has anything to do with. Um, the relation to these two incidents and, and what we're going to need to do in order to get past it. I guess that's where you and I disagree. I think it has a lot to do with our infrastructure needs. Mm. Joe, final thought back to you before the top of the hour break. Well, I, I, I'll i tell you a state that has done well, uh, at least in terms of teacher pay, is Wyoming. Uh, if you look at Wyoming, their average teacher salary uh, compared to the rest of the country is, is one of the highest in the, in the country for starting teachers. They've done innovative things with their severance tax money. They pool it. They've set it aside. They create funds with it. Uh, they earn interest off of it. And it gives them a much more predictive uh, tax and revenue base off, the, off which to operate. Uh, and, and so they have really done some things that West Virginia needs to look at. But that's one state, Rob, to answer your question, that has done very well, in, in at least in one area. And, and handling a teacher shortage is making sure that the pay is attractive enough to get people into those jobs. That's interesting because you remember the teachers wanted to tie PEIA funding to the extraction taxes on the fossil fuel industries in the state, and uh, they were told it's too volatile of a revenue source to tie it to PEIA. So it's interesting that Wyoming's doing that, Joe. Yeah, it is. I heard a speaker address that very point. And uh, in fact, there's a question I raised uh, one time a while ago with one of our guests on the show uh, that we should look into innovative ways to, to pull that money, set it aside like almost like a rainy day fund so that we know it's more predictive because it's so volatile right now that it's really hard to have any policy, financial policy based upon severance tax revenues. Yeah, what Joe's what Joe's talking about is pooling this money so that you have it set aside now the volatility goes away because all you're talking about is the the income that you earn on the money um like a rainy day fund and if you get enough of it and certainly west virginia's may be a little late coming to the game but we certainly have lots of uh extraction money uh in this state and we could do something like that even on a small level and devote it to paying for PEIA insurance. Well, or the issue I have with that, though, is you're now taking tax revenue and you're completely taking it out of play and saying we're only – it's almost like what a university does with their endowments. We're taking a bunch of money that we could use, and instead it's now no longer being used. We're just going to take uh, the interest off of it and then fund teacher pay with it. Right, but it's, it's used for investment. For, for example, I mean, it drives uh, that, those funds set aside wouldn't just be sitting in a savings account in a bank. They'd be invested in the stocks of companies that may build factories in West Virginia and facilities in West Virginia. It, it leads me to the question of where are we getting the money that we're going to give Form Energy? <laughs> um, you know, 
is that coming out of this surplus as well? Because I thought the surplus was only a billion. If you give seven fifty back to the to the folks, and you give three hundred million more, that's more than a billion on my arithmetic. So I don't know where they're getting that three hundred million that they're going to give those folks. I, I don't know. We take our break here, Bill. Do you have a final point? Yeah, severance pay. Uh, uh, there's been some suggestion using it as a bargaining chip. Uh, that we we give our severance pay, which is not very much, back to those counties where the extraction is actually taking place. And then we can see if we can get a, uh, uh, some sort of a locality pay because of it. I don't think that we really need our severance pay in Berkeley County. In McDowell County, they do. We did uh, the intros uh, for the panel when we brought out the entire crew at 835. I understand we had Wi-Fi problems at that time. Uh, so the radio uh, audience got it. Uh, Colin says he'll try to post those on uh, YouTube later on if you're uh, at all concerned that you missed them. And I, I know most of you are. Yeah, that's as <laughs> people spend their whole week in anticipation of your intros. You know, I honestly did get an email to that effect. <laughs> I'm not making this up. I honestly did get an email saying something to that. Yeah, like they, a, they say okay. what's said around the table is garbage, but your intro more than makes up <laughs> they, for it. They didn't say that, but they, they, I, there is at least I mean, like one a, intro fan out there. Joe, like I was not talking wife, about you. Wife, I have a compilation. I've yeah. got them all saved in a Word document. You're, you mean your wife has a day off today? Is that it? <laughs> no, no, she never listens to the show. <laughs> she's, she's too busy. Uh, and let's uh, go with, our, uh, by the way, Chris Anders was filling in the Mike Carl chair today. Uh, Chris is uh, ill. He cannot make it today. So we have a Friday four. Uh, that's discussing the issues of the day, to which we move to issue number two in studio with Larry Schultz. Yes. Uh, is there a remedy for Fox News' now demonstrated willingness to tell bald-faced lies to help the Republican Party, even at the expense of American democracy? My, my question arises from the stuff that's been released about Tucker Carlson saying he hates Donald Trump passionately in a text to the other people during the time that this was all going on. Would you ever get that idea from listening to him speak? They now have revealed a tremendous amount of material from a variety of Fox hosts saying they don't like Trump, they thought he lost the election, and all the rest of it, yet they got on there day after day after day and said, um, you know, this election's been stolen and we need to tear this apart and Dominion voting systems did this and that and the other. Um, have they finally, uh, at Fox News, destroyed any remaining reputation for being some sort of arbiter of the truth? Um, if we now know that they actually hate Donald Trump and they, they got on TV every day to tell us how much they loved him and how right he was, um, have we finally crossed that line? And will it take something more than just the apparent uh, billion-dollar judgment that uh, Dominion Voting uh, Systems seeks uh, to make it happen so that Fox News either changes or goes away? And the, the funny aspect of all this is, had they not gone after Dominion Voting directly and named them as they did, none of this would have ever come out. Right. right. Alonzo, let's go to you first. Well, I think that, you know, this is just a simple case of selective outrage. You know, if if let's let's be honest, are we mad that, you know, uh, they have told something on the air that they don't believe? Is that is that the essence of what we're mad about? What are we actually upset about here? That's that's what's important. First. Second is I understand this this need for or not even need this want this desire for um, you know, journalism to have integrity. I am a proponent of that. I want, you know, the truth. I don't care about the narrative. I just want truth. And, you know, uh, we can all idolize about the days of Walter Cronkite and say, you know, um, uh, that was back in the golden era of, of news. But the, the truth of the matter and what's, what's fact is that there's always going to be this. And I, I would hard press you to believe that, you know, 
uh, if we check the emails, the texts of every CNN and MSNBC and any other organization that was, uh, you know, touting the Black Lives Matter protests in 2020 as, you know, a peaceful protest that afterward they rolled off the air and was like, yo, th this is bad. This does not look good. There are federal buildings being attacked. There is burning uh, uh, across the nation. There's over 700 officer deaths, you know, and, and to sit here. And right now, look at this and say that there needs to be some type of remedy or some type of legislation or or something that comes out of it. It may hurt more than they want it to help. That's that's really all I have to say on the matter. I think yeah, it's I'm, a truism that you so, know, so that it's clear. I'm not advocating for some legislation. We have the legislation in place. I'm a very big proponent for a lot of years now of our civil justice system. And I think it can fashion a remedy that will. Um, be painful for Rupert Murdoch, but I'm not too worried that he's going to be begging for handouts. Um, I, you know, he's got plenty of other money set aside. But the the point I want to make is this: none of those other networks ever incited a crowd to attack the capital of the United States with lies. None of them. That's and Fox not did true. that. And uh, they, they did it. They, they, they even they, though they knew these things were not true, they did not go on there and say, "Look, if you want to go to the Capitol and have a protest, that's fine, but you better be careful because a lot of this stuff is not true that Donald Trump is telling you." They knew it. They had a duty to report it, and they reported the opposite, and it wound up with uh, a terrible mess at the Capitol, including threats to Mike Pence's life. Look what CNN did to Nick Sandman, the kid that, you know, had the uh, Indian or Native American guy, excuse me, you know, banging the, the stuff in front of his face and then portraying it as he was some type of, you know, evil kid, like he wasn't on a school trip and, and being well behaved. Let's look at, you know, the issue. And, and he won a civil lawsuit. It's time. It's a for, truism. Right. It's but, a, it, but it's he won a civil lawsuit because it wasn't true. Okay, and so that was a, a a in comparison very small thing involving one kid, it, not a very big thing involving the peaceful transfer of power in the United States of America, which is something that we've had ever since we've been a country. Let's that that that's a different thing altogether. It's similar, but it's way smaller in scale. Okay, well, let's bring something up to scale. What about the the diminishment of the efficacy of a president, a plot to take the president, right? When we have people like Adam Schiff doing a media circuit after the in independent investigation of the Russia hoax, the scandal that was disproven by the independent investigator, they found the origin of the documents that circulated through the DOJ, went through FISA court, all the way back to the Hillary Clinton Foundation or whatnot. And now you still have, I would argue, 90% of Democrats still believe that there was Russian collusion because Adam Schiff, somebody that used his title, being an intelligence committee uh, operative, was doing a media campaign saying that there's still stuff out there I just can't say. And there's no evidence of it, none whatsoever. And that uh, is a, a the a, civil a justice system lie. is open to those victims, as you've now labeled them, uh, any day of the week. Instead, they filed 60 bogus lawsuits as soon as he lost the election and they lost every single one of them. Uh, look, th that civil justice system is the same for everybody uh, there. And they could have brought those claims. They did not. That leads me to believe that there's nothing there. There's lots of lawyers out there who want to make uh, want to make a giant fee by suing Fox News, but they're not going to do it unless they have the evidence. And Wanda, they let's, do. let's come back to you and get Bill in here, Bill. Well, yeah, aren't you glad we got the definition of the Lincoln Douglas debate? <laughs> 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 we're, we're seeing a perfect example of it. Going back to your question, Larry, I think uh, Alonzo answered it uh, on the key. Uh, if there's going to be a impact on Fox News. It's not going to be persuading the loyal Fox listeners that they have been 
misled. It's going to be from the dollars and cents. If the court system uh, gives uh, Dominion what they're asking for, I think it's about $1.4 billion, that's going to be a lot of money to make up. The other consequence may be what it has done internally between Murdoch and some of their their uh, prime uh, uh, prime individuals such as Tucker Carlson, uh, Ingram, and the like. Uh, there has to be a more plenty relationship now than what it was three weeks ago. But your basic question, I think, was: Is this are the uh, stuff that's been revealed now through the Dominion? Is that going to convince the the loyal listeners of Fox News that they have been misled and there's going to be a mad a massive pushback against Fox News? And I don't th- I think the answer is no. Alonzo just answered that. <laughs> Joe Ferretti, let's go to you next before we get back involved in the circuit here. Well, r- real quickly with. Alonzo's point about there being no evidence of Russian collusion. My goodness, uh, Paul Manafort, who was running the Trump campaign, was communicating and sharing information with Russian operatives Kalimnik and Deripaska, oligarchs and, and operatives in the in, in, in the Russian government, and and <laughs> he went to jail. So I, I mean, I, I don't think there's enough smoke there to investigate that. I, I, I think it's too broad of a statement to say there was no evidence whatsoever. Uh, but back to this point about Fox News, and, and this, I, I don't think in our lifetime we have seen such a coordination between a presidency and a major news organization as we've just witnessed with Fox News. And I'll bring it home to West Virginia. It's come out in these emails that Trump called Murdoch and said he wanted something done about Don Blankenship's campaign for the Senate seat in West Virginia. And within days, Fox News were running news articles and and exposés on Don Blankenship and what a bad guy he is and how how could anybody support him in a run for U.S. Senate. We have never seen such coordination like that. And that needs to come to light. As was, uh, to borrow a phrase, you know, daylight's the best disinfectant. And, And I think the more that comes to light, and I hope more comes to light, the more we'll see how broken some of these news organizations are. And I don't just mean Fox News, okay? I understand other people are concerned about biases elsewhere, and, and boy, they exist. But I don't think we've ever seen such coordination like we've seen here, and I think it needs to be exposed. All right, back to you, Alonzo. Well, I just think that this is the nature of the beast. I I. I... I understand the the concerns, but I think that this is where, you know, viewers and listeners must be, you know, instilled with the tools to be able to uh, discriminate between fact and fiction and avoid this, um, I guess, cognitive dissonance. This is something that is a both side issue. And if we truly care about, you know, factual journalism and and coming out on the other side of this better than beforehand, then we have to admit that, you know, there are functional issues with the media circuit right now in uh, our lives. And, you know, that's not something that, you know, is highlighted on just one side. This isn't more coordinated than any other period of time with the other side of the aisle. This is just merely a, 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 highlight or a spotlight being put on a singular event or whatnot a microscope being held to a small event and saying that this is larger than what we believe it to be it's this is narrative mi- it it's pumps a microscope money microscope held to one of the most important events in the history of the united states when they tried to stop the peaceful transfer of power and so this isn't just what does um you know, what does the average American think about whether the Russians had information they shouldn't have about our election? This is people uh, beating police officers um, in, into injured states and overrunning the Capitol, demanding to hang Mike Pence. That sets it apart from some um, fake outrage about some kid uh, staring down an American, uh, Native American leader or whatever. It sets it apart completely. And if we don't, if the, if the news organizations are not held to account, no one will be. 
what's coordinated is watching, you know, uh, some of the January 6th tapes now being released by Fox News that are showing, you know, evidence contrary to what has been peddled uh-huh. nonstop, relentlessly, <laughs> relentlessly. Things that, what, you that's know, the same on. liar. That's the same liar, what, Tucker Carlson. If we're Carlson. talking about the same coordinated one. events, though, if we're speaking about coordination, right? The fact that the uh, the government can withhold all of these types of in- information, create a narrative or whatnot, and and really isolate any other conflicting nature or whatnot, and what is being told is that if that's wrong, if that's the issue that we're talking about, then I'll agree with you. But what I don't agree is that this is just. Uh, it's in a vacuum. This is one issue that that is only being found here on the right. That's 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 a fallacy. This is an issue uh, across the board or whatnot. And the stuff that has happened throughout MSNBC, CNN is just as bad and just as frequent as what we have witnessed with this Fox thing. But it's not been documented. Bill. It's not been displayed. It's got to be proved. It's got to be proved. Joe Ferretti. Yeah, I, I, I would say, uh, first of all, the, the withholding of some of that footage, uh, my gosh, even McConnell and, and other leading Republicans come out of the and said that that was justified due to security reasons. Um, yeah, now, you know, <laughs> Tucker Carlson's been, been lambasted uh, about his so-called presentation of unaired uh, footage, and, and it's going nowhere. So I, I don't understand that argument. But, look, I... I, I I would simply ask, have we seen the level of coordination between a presidency and a news organization like we've seen in, in between 2016 and 2020? I, I would submit we have not. And, and Larry is correct. Uh, the ramifications of that all the way up through January 6th were pretty dire for this country. And, and, and I think it's on a different level than saying that Adam Schiff is a, is a boob for, for, you know, touting Russian uh, – collusion. Uh, it's just a different level. And I, and I think that uh, the civil justice system will bear out that uh, it was at a different level. And I think you're going to see Dominion getting uh, a pretty healthy award at some point. First off, let me salute Alonzo because he's going one on three here. <laughs> and, and this happens during the commercial breaks, too, by the way. <laughs> and and, 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 and he's, he's doing an admirable job, and he's not backing down. He's not. So I, I applaud him. So yeah. I don't agree with him, but I applaud just him. Just so you know, the pressure's not off Alonzo when we go to commercial break. I just want you to know that. In fact, in fact it intensifies. <laughs> Listen, I, it's all love. It's, all, it's love. all love. Larry, comes back to you for the final word. Uh, I simply think that. Fox News is going to get hurt badly by this judgment. Uh, it will be interesting to see what any appellate court does with it. Um, they demanded uh, in their complaint $1.6 billion, but I'm pretty sure that doesn't include the punitive damages they will also be seeking. And that should be fascinating under the New York Times versus Sullivan standard, uh, the actual malice standard, uh, which, by the way, if you hear about that all the time. What it means is simply... You knew to a certainty that it was false, and you said it anyway. That's one way to prove actual malice. You knew to a certainty. It wasn't a mistake. You didn't want it negligent, failed to do your homework. You knew it was wrong, and you said it. And they're proving that on the front page uh, of every newspaper in the country now. So uh, I think that Fox is going to get hurt. I don't know that it will drive their listeners away. I don't think so. But it may drive some of their advertisers away, which is a lot more effective (laughs) in terms of making them shut up. Now, we move on to issue number three with the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Uh, Rob, mine's going to be fairly quick because we've got to save some time for Alonzo because I know his will generate a lot more spirited (laughs) discussion. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Senator Manchin was on a national uh, Sunday morning talk show last Sunday, uh, and the issue came up with him running for president. Uh, That followed up with uh, some local local discussion in the state, uh, followed up by Wall Street Journal doing an article, and then... And more recently, Wall Street Journal, which is a, a conservative uh, a publication, uh, did an editorial. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, does Senator Manchin have a realistic path to the presidency? I'm going to leave that as a question, and then I have my own opinion that I'll uh, mention after the fact. All right, Joe Ferretti, let's have you go first here. <clears throat> uh, if 
our options in 2024 are Donald Trump and Joe Biden, I think it increases the chances that Joe Manchin will run for president. If there are other candidates who are nominated, I don't think you'll hear from Joe Manchin in terms of the presidency. Uh, So I I think he's looking – when he says at the end of this year he's going to make a decision about his intentions, and we know he's up in 2024 for the U.S. Senate seat here in West Virginia, and that's in play too. So I I think he wants to see – genuinely wants to see what the landscape is going to be and where his political fortunes lie. And I believe he will decide as part of this no labels group in Washington, that these middle of the road people who don't fancy themselves as ardent Republicans or ardent Democrats. I think he will pick up the banner for them and consider a run if we have those two options on the ballot. And uh, he's already done some things behind the scenes in terms of uh, gauging the financial interest and support he might get and where the political spectrum is for him. Are there enough people in the middle to support a candidacy? But I think that will be an historic election if we're looking at Trump versus Biden again. And I think Joe will will seriously look at it. Other than that, uh, I don't think uh, he, he might not be running for anything. If uh, if the presidency uh, campaign doesn't come to fruition, uh, uh, Joe, are you saying you think he would run as a Democrat or as a third party candidate? I think he'll run as an independent. Mm-hmm. No. Wow! Go ahead, Alonzo. No. I think that's 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 very bold. I, I don't. I couldn't see that happening. Um, I do think that this is. If, if there was any time to run for president for Manchin, it's right now. And I don't think that there would be another opportunity just the way, you know, that the Democrat Party has, you know, just changed so much. Uh, you know, it, I mean, look at Democrats in 2008 in comparison to now. You know, I mean, it's it's a dramatic change in, you know, the things that they care about, what their party has, has championed. And I think that Manchin has right now uh, the, the most prominent time probably in his career ever to to run. I mean, he's got a national name now. He's got, you know, uh, support from from both sides on certain issues and, you know, can be that that same thing that uh, Joe Biden advertised. I don't believe that he has been, but advertised, you know, in bringing this country together, being, um, you know, a moderate and I think that there's still a taste for that. There's still a quench for that, even going into 2024. But I don't think that um, Joe Biden has the, the, the health to do so. And I think that with Manchin right now, there's no other time than this year. And I don't think that running as an independent would be fruitful at all. So you have to go through the Democratic primary and beat Biden is what you're saying. I, I, and I do. I think that he could. Larry Schultz. Uh, yeah, I don't see him doing anything by running a third party campaign um, except to make Joe Biden's win over Donald Trump slightly less uh, by slightly fewer votes and to then of course engender maybe 120 lawsuits that all fail saying that um, Arizona and Michigan (laughs) and Pennsylvania cheated cheated the people of America by the way they counted the votes. I don't think anybody in this country is ready to replay that. If Joe Manchin runs as a Democrat, um, he could hurt Biden enough um, to cause maybe a change, maybe to open a spot for somebody else. But to get right down to it, I cannot see a majority of American voters or even enough to win an Electoral College victory of American voters voting for Joe Manchin for president of the United States as an just, ind- as an independent as, or as a Democrat or whatever as anything as a as a um, as a zebra as anything if he if he runs as any kind of person I do not see him garnering enough votes to be anything more than a potential spoiler for somebody Bill what's your pathway yeah well there's two pathways uh, the uh, Wall Street Journal would argue as an independent and their editor was he could win as an independent uh, uh, the other pathway that I think is more viable because an independent uh, has uh, Ross Perot got I think uh, uh, 15 
percent. That's the closest, the highest any independent has had. So trying to win as an independent is tough. But the Wall Street Journal says he could do it as an independent. I think the other, the more viable alternative would be running as a Democrat. And, but this could only happen if certain things fell into play. And I don't think it makes any difference at all uh, what happens on the Republican side. It's going to what happens on the Democratic side in the primary. Uh, if there is a host of folks getting on the, the, uh, running on the, uh, running for president on the Democratic side, I don't think you'll see Joe Manchin anywhere close to him. However, if it's only Biden and every, and most of the viable candidates are not going to run against the incumbent president, they show, they, they feel they, that's not something they should do. So it's quite feasible that they would not be a, a any other candidates running against Biden. So if that, if uh, so, Manchin could see that as an opportunity to run against Biden, and Biden, and Manchin has something Biden does not have, and that is a perception of youth. Even though uh, Manchin is is 75, he looks like he's 65 or 60. Even he carries himself much better. If it's just those two, I think a lot of folks would look at Manchin as a as the a better. Uh, flag barrier for the party than what Manchin, other than what Biden would be. One, he's charismatic. He's done a very nice job of painting himself as a centralist that will identify to everybody except the extremes of both parties. Uh, people want to find a centralist. People want to find someone that can work together. They want to find someone that will compromise. That's high on every everyone's list of things. And Biden provides, uh, excuse me, Manchin provides that. So I think if, if unless a bunch bunch of folks jump in the ring to run against Biden, and if Manchin's the only one, I think that's a very real pathway to the presidency. And again, I think if it comes up with a uh, a someone that's perceived as a centralist, as a compromiser, as something that can work and get things done, I think that will carry itself well in the general as it would in the primary. And he pushed back to what Bill just said. I, I just um, I disagree. I, I I don't think that uh, this guy who, as recently as two weeks ago, we were talking about losing to Jim Justice in a race for the Senate. Uh, I don't think. Yeah. No, no, we're, we're not talking about winning in West Virginia. No, I'm not done. sure that he could win in West Virginia, right. but I think he could win nationwide. You know, well, Lonzo, you seem to agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think that there's an election that he could get in right now that he okay. would win. Okay, let's high five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the first time in six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Joey Torts. Well, I, I just agree that Joe Manchin has those great Italian jeans, right? Yes, he does, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad he's wearing a suit all the time. You can't see him. <laughs> Looking good, baby. Looking good. Hey, uh, so we move on now to. Oh, by the way, if you want to know if Joe's running for something, you got to watch the what I call the Mansion Mario meter. Joe comes on the show a lot. He's running for something, and he was on last yeah. week. Yeah. Okay. Watch the Mansion Mario yeah. meter, yeah. and he promised more appearances. So he's running for something. What it is, I don't know. Governor, <laughs> senator, president, I don't know. And he's keeping his. His options very close to his chest. Everything's open yeah. right now. All right, issue number four, we close down with Alonzo Perry. So uh, I want to talk about something that I don't think, you know, ever gets enough attention. I think, you know, um, and that, that's ESG, right, environmental social governance. So uh, there's a House bill right now. It's 2862, and it's uh, – designed to stop corporate proxy votes for shareholders not pertaining to pecuniary interests. To put that in English, uh, it stops shareholders from casting votes on anything unrelated to um, basically expand capital, right? Um, so right now what we're seeing is a hybrid of corporate shareholders acting as de facto legislators. And um, – they're basically pushing restrictions on gas, oil, coal investments. Uh, they're including things like diversity and equity uh, training or DIE um, with inclusion in that too as well. And they're incentivizing political behavior over their fiduciary responsibility. So what I have to ask to the group is whether or not you support ESG, uh, do you feel as if 
um, this is a threat or um, do you believe that this bill is targeting what we uh, should be talking about? Joe Ferretti, going to you first on the phone. Well, th- this, I, I, first of all, we, when somebody has a fiduciary responsibility, they are required by law to act in the best interest of their clients. So to argue that consideration of ESG uh, issues is a violation of a fiduciary responsibility and voting how uh, your shares should be allocated, how your shares of a corporation uh, or whether to support that corporation as part of investment. If that all comes back to fiduciary responsibility, there's a remedy for that, and it's called the court system, and it's called a breach of fiduciary responsibility. So uh, this law, which uh, the, the investment management board members in the state of West Virginia are adamantly against as nothing but political grandstanding by Riley Moore, uh, it, 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 it's it's really constraining how these people, these fund managers, act. And if we accept that they have a fiduciary responsibility, they are going to act in the best interest of their shareholders and those pensioners and others in the state of West Virginia who rely upon the growth of that money. They're required by law to do so. So this is nothing more than adding on additional constraints that are appealing to a certain part of the political spectrum that think that environmental and social governance issues should have no place in how we invest our money and how corporations should act, which is really contrary to reality. There's a reason why oil and gas companies are not upgrading refineries, because they see the writing on the wall that those refineries are not going to be operating at full capacity in 20 or 30 years. So why should they spend their money there? Some people would call that ESG. I call that good financial sense. So I, I, I don't understand this issue at all. I, I think uh, Riley Moore contends it's, it's to get politics out of investing. I think it injects politics into investing, and it, and it constrains those who do have those fiduciary responsibilities. And, and so I, I see it's just a, a lot of hot air about nothing. And and to a point about Riley's involvement in this, if I believe, if I recall correctly, and Bill, I think you were on for the interview, Riley got involved in this because there was a concern at one point with the way the banks were trending that uh, those in the state in the fossil fuel industries would have a difficult time getting money, getting money, yeah. obtaining capital because the banks were being pressured to not do any business with any fossil fuel companies in this country. And that's initially how Riley got involved in that whole scenario there. Larry, let's go to you next. I just don't think you can pass a law that would accomplish what it is they seek to accomplish here. It's a little murky and it's it's kind of hard to understand, but somehow it's not up to a bank all of a sudden to make the judgment Joe was talking about that the fossil fuel industry is going the way um, um, is going the way of the dodo bird and is going away and we've got to keep investing in it because we're a west virginia bank and west virginia depends on coal there'll come a point where that's blindness and that means bankruptcy and that is that would be the breach of fiduciary duty i don't think i need to uh, as a shareholder myself i don't think i need a lecture from riley moore or anyone in the west virginia legislature about what i need to think about the shares i've invested in and how i want to vote those shares um i'm not clear whether they're going to apply this just to government investment arms or whether they're going to apply it to individual shareholders so i can't think that um uh, fossil fuels are bad uh if i hold uh stock in form energy which uh, makes energy storage systems uh you know it's really kind of funny we're getting ready to throw 300 million into energy storage systems form energy well what's that going to do to the gasoline market when everybody's driving an electric car 
And so isn't that, uh, doesn't that somehow fit under this too? Couldn't you pass a law to say, well, wait a minute, we can't use state funds to bring these electric cars here. We have all this uh, petroleum production in, in West Virginia, and we need to sell our petroleum. That was uh, that was some of the pushback that. on that, yeah. by the way, Larry. Uh, uh, that just that just makes no sense. It's way too limiting for it seems to me proper, thoughtful investment of state funds. Way too limiting. Billy, yeah, I read twenty six uh, twenty eight sixty two, and at no time was ESG spelled out or mentioned. It may have been implied. It may have been the bed uh, bedrock, but it was not mentioned at all. Uh, if I'm uh, uh, and I have, I'm not privy to what's been said in the boardrooms of some of these financial organizations. They could very well address this issue. I have no idea. I do know for a fact, though, there are no laws at the federal level, and I assume at most state level, that says you have to consider ESG. There are no laws that says that. Uh, and uh, so what ESG uh, said, it's, uh, it's, there's an option. It's an option that financial advisors, financial investors uh, take into account as broad a spectrum as they, as they choose, as they can. And, and if I'm having someone advising my investment money, I don't want to be limited to just a small sector of the community, financial community. I want them to look at as broad a spectrum as they possibly can. Now, West Virginia is not the first state to do this. Kansas and Indiana uh, tried to pass very restrictive laws that says it cannot, anything dealing with ESG, you cannot invest. Until the Chamber of Commerce, the local businesses, came and did yep. a price index and found out it would cost Indiana, uh, example, uh, nearly $7 billion over 10 years if they followed this strict ESG pro- pro- prohibition. Uh, that's what gets into my pocketbook, where $7 billion over a period of time. Uh, Kansas came up with the same, same conclusion. They backed off. So the state said, unless they've been driven with an ideology, and I think that's what this is, a strong ideology, if they're looking at it from a financial aspect, they are taking, they're having second thoughts. Alonzo, back to you. I mean, this is just, you know, uh, this is a non-intrusive way to put a check on, you know, some of the giant entities that are uh, let me, let influencing. Me back non-intrusive. Yes. That is exactly what it is. It's intrusive. No, it is it, intrusive. It's what, telling what you cannot do as a financial manager. What we're seeing. You cannot look at this sector. You are prohibited from looking at this sector. You can look at the other financial sectors, but not this one. That's intrusive, my friend. What's not, what's not intrusive is telling people that they must focus on what shareholders have focused on since the invention of limited liability corporations, right? That's that we, you are designed to maximize shareholder profits. Now, if there is a better investment option, I'm all for that. But the problem is is that we are creating an artificial failure in a lot of these investments, whether it be, you know, uh, this isn't grandstanding or bad investing saying, you know, uh, we're going to stop spending money on oil and gas or, or we're not going to put the money for, you know, construction of a refinery. You know, you're creating an artificial failure by saying that if banks are, are putting money in this, then they're going to get a bad ESG score. And then, you know, these two giant asset managers that require, you know, or uh, hold 10 times the GDP of the U.S. aren't going to give you money for your projects. It's, it's artificial. You know? Let me ask you, you used the term, if there it was a better financial investment, uh, to be made, uh, you're all for it. But yet this bill precludes that potentially better financial investment. I would say it precludes an uh, uh, entity of coming into West Virginia and voting in place of these organizations. And that's why it doesn't spell out ESG particularly, but it creates a system to where shareholders focus on uh, the fiduciary aspect and not this. Uh, and that's all we can ask for. If, that's all we can ask for, to concentrate on the, all considerations of the fiduciary responsibility. So but this s- bill does just the opposite. It limits what, you can, what they can consider. It mm-hmm. doesn't, uh, the other ESG is, is uh, uh, 
promo, uh, says you can look at everything equally. This bill does not. It says you can not, anything dealing with ESG, you cannot consider. See, this is moving, though, in a direction that it's, it's, it's being exacerbated, right? Look at Morningstar that created this uh, funding mechanism or this ranking system called BDS, right, where it's defunding, you know, uh, people that are pro-Israel in some type of way. You know, I can see this spiraling out of control, and that's why there is a, a, a mode to preemptively stop you know, these shareholders from divvying up society, atomizing them into, you know, their their political interests and then allowing them to create, you know, uh, some type of of mechanism that creates issues in the marketplace. They're distorting the market by uh, so creating these. Investment so strategies. What, you're, what you're saying now is that we're taking legislative, making legislative decisions based upon what ifs. What if this happened? What if that happened? That's not but it's the, happening now, and people's but pension is it to, funds. To our destruction, the, uh, our, according to Kansas, according to Nebraska, according to others, it's uh, uh, the investment fund, your retirement fund, are not being hurt. They will be hurt if you impose this ESG prohibition. I don't think – I mean, we are – Stopping any type of of funding into you know Ten um, issues with climate, right? But what is happening is that when you are making it to where climate related issues are the focus, then you are creating a distortion in the market that is harming people, and people's pension funds are being used for issues they don't care about. On Alonzo, you got the final word as it was your issue. Hey, post of the day goes to Keith Johnson. If you're a far-right conservative Republican, you watch Fox and Newsmax. If you're a far-left wing who believes in the Democrats' policies, you watch CNN and MSNBC. However, if you want a true down-the-middle analysis of the news, you watch Eastern Panhandle Talk. Everyone. <laughs>